Good morning and welcome to First Light. It's Wednesday. I'm glad that you're with me today. We're in Haggai chapter 1, and we looked at one of the toughest passages in the whole Bible. Um, God's people have been having some serious difficulties in their lives, a drought, and they don't have enough food and problems and difficulties. And God said, look, I'm the one that's responsible for, well, you're the one responsible, but I'm the call. I've been doing this because of you. And the people have been living in rebellion. They've been lackadaisical. They just have not been wholeheartedly following God in the rebuilding of the temple. And so because they're so hard-headed, uh, God has brought these consequences into their lives. I wanted to just pick up very briefly. Um, I want us to be in this morning Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, because there is a spiritual principle that's very important for us to understand. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6, um, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Now, um, that's let me give you the modern Ronnie Bearden translation of that. When it says God cannot be mocked, we might say it this way, and it would mean exactly the same thing. You cannot make a fool out of God. You can't. So don't be deceived. First of all, it's possible to be deceived. You'll, I, I'm going to preach a sermon one, one day on self-deception, deceiving yourself about things. Because the Apostle Paul, in fact, you might want to just look up the sermon before I preach it to you. Uh, you might want to look that up. Just do a search of do not be deceived and just look at the things that the Apostle Paul said that many times, which implies it's possible to know God and yet be deceived. So he said, don't be deceived. You can't make a fool out of God. And here's the truth. A person reaps what he sows. Okay? So what would be making a fool out of God? What would make a fool out of God is to plant sin, re rebellion, and wickedness and think that you're going to get some other kind of good, wonderful crop out of it. To think that you could plant wheat and not get wheat. Or to, let's put it another way, to think that you can plant blackberries and have a wonderful harvest of apples. It ain't going to happen. You're going to get a lot of stickers and thorns in you. So verse 7, Galatians 6, 7 and, and 8. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what he sows. The one who sows, that's planting, to please his sinful nature, his flesh, will from that nature reap destruction. So you plant sin in your life and selfishness and self-centeredness, and you're going to harvest destruction, which means you can make a fool out of God or think you can. You can mock God if you, you think you can by saying, I'm going to plant fleshly sinful nature stuff that is of its nature rebellion, and I'm going to get great holiness and goodness out of it. No, you're not. You're trying to make a fool out of God, and it isn't possible. The one who sows or plants to please the Spirit from the Holy Spirit will reap eternal life. And so, friends, as we go back to Haggai now, Haggai chapter 1, the, the, the moral of what we've looked at with the Apostle Paul and what God was saying through the prophet Haggai in chapter 1 is that God does not bless rebellion. And I'm telling you, I've met lots of people who say and think that he does. And he doesn't. He doesn't. I've met so many people who are living in rebellion. They're living totally contrary to what the scripture says. And then they just brag on how God is just doing all this in their lives. And, and I, I don't doubt that good things come into their lives. But I, I honestly think that they're deceived in thinking that God is the one blessing people so that they can be rebellious. And while they're rebellious. 
If I were the devil, that's how I'd trick people. I'd bring some good things into their lives just to trick them so that they'll keep on being rebellious and thumb their nose at God and turn their backs on him. That's just my opinion, okay? So uh, we've, been in, we're, we've been in Haggai, and the prophet has been preaching now and brings this word from the Lord. And there's so many places in Scripture, like with Jeremiah, when the prophet would speak, thus says the Lord, and the people would not listen. That's not what happened this time. They listened. Isn't that good? They listened. So I'm in Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, he's the governor, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Now, this is important. Um, when I first came to First Methodist, I preached a series of sermons on the fear of the Lord. And there are different words in Hebrew uh, for the, that we translate both as fear, but they don't quite mean the same thing. Some modern translations treat them differently, and I think that's good. So there is, there is to be afraid of God, truly afraid. And the better phrase, I think, in English of that is uh, the terror of the Lord. Instead of the fear of the Lord, it's the terror of the Lord. There are times when the wrath of God and his judgment are such that people who are in rebellion and lost people ought to be scared. I mean, they got something to be scared about. But then there's this usage. And this has to do with this kind of fear is a holy awe, a respect, a wow moment. And I think that fits the context here so much better because God says, you've been paying attention to your houses for years, and my house lies in ruin. So what do they think of God? What do they think of God? By ignoring and neglecting the house of God. They obviously don't think too much of him. So now they're at a place where they fear the Lord. It's not that they're so much scared of God. It's that their eyes have been opened to a reverent, holy awe, and it's time to get serious about following God. And then verse 13, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. And so verse 14, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. And they came and began to work on the house of God, the Lord their Almighty, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of the reign of Darius. Sometimes we just skip over those numbers, but we ought to, why don't we just pay attention to them, okay? So... This says that they went back to work on the 24th day of the sixth month. But in chapter 1, verse 1, it says this when the prophecy started. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month. So the prophet Zechariah preached for a couple of days, we don't know how long, before word started getting around. And so approximately within three weeks, the people got their act together and they began to work back on the, uh, the temple again. And uh, this is powerful, friends. We're going to talk more about this next time. I want you to notice, first of all, that that what's missing you remember there's we, we we're looking at times when you do bible study sometimes you ask the question what's missing what's missing the answer is a command of the king that's why they stopped you remember the king says quit building i forbid you the new king says i forbid you from building and so the people quit and there was no mention 
You won't find it in Ezra. No mention of crying out to God. No mention of fasting. No, no mention of seeking God through the high priest. No mention of saying, Lord, help us out in this situation. They just said, okay. And now, by the same token, look at what's missing here. They are still under the order of a king to not build. And they started building anyway. Well, that's different, isn't it? So hang on to that thought because we'll be coming back to that. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Sometimes prophetic messages are rather long. And we kind of get tired of listening to them. Jeremiah had some long ones and some of the other prophets had some really long ones. Here we have a word from the Lord and listen to how short it is. This is one of the shortest prophetic messages from God speaking through a human being, a prophet, his word. It's in verse 13. Here is the word of the Lord to these people. I am with you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's with you. And that's enough to honor God and to follow through. So I want you to notice the combination of things that come together in this passage. So there's a kind of repentance that happens. It doesn't say that. But the word of the Lord at the beginning of the chapter is a lot of bad things have been happening in your life. I'm the one that's been doing it because of you. Have you been noticing all this bad stuff going on? It's me, because you won't honor me with the rebuilding. And so now they begin to fear the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, their reverence and their awe, their taking seriously God has risen up. The next thing is the presence of God is with them. I'm telling you, when people fear the Lord, not scared of him, when people stand in awe and reverence of what a mighty God we serve and it pans out in their lives, I'm telling you, God's with people like that in a powerful way. And then they began work. They put obedience into play. They obeyed the command of God at, at this moment with the potential of great negative harm to them. They're going to obey God. And God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. Some of us needed to hear that message this morning. That God will not bless disobedience. But look at the blessing that has already begun with obedience. The first blessing is the presence of God. The powerful presence of God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for a group of people in the Bible, because there's so many examples of hard-headed ones who wouldn't listen. I thank you for a, an example in the Bible of a group of people who heard a word from the Lord and then changed, who had soft hearts. They listened and they responded. And Lord, that's what we want to have, hearts that respond to you. And I'm thankful for the powerful promise that you will be with us. And so there are moments that we might be fearful and scared. There are times when we're uncertain. There are times when we just don't know what's going to happen next and we feel so tentative and unsettled. But knowing that you're with us makes all the difference in the world. Whether it's a COVID crisis, whether it's difficulties at my job, whether it's difficulties in my finances or my marriage or other areas of life, Lord, or if it's a serious illness, whatever's going on, knowing that you're with us makes all the difference in the world. We hear those words of King David in our mind. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thank you for your precious presence, Lord. For we pray this, rejoicing and as glad people, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. This is First Light.